carefully put Claude's book by his bedside so that he'd see it. She was hoping him, she might be able to sell it to the movies, which she did. Um, and it became that film, Beat the Devil. You must, I think it's on DVD, it's available in DVD now, but it's Scott Coburn's book turned into an amazing film. Totally bizarre. Claude Coburn. A flourish of sunlight in the room where we live now. Cigarette smoke in the air. Your clothes moves, move as if to meet your body when you bend to watch sunlight on the sea. Fishermen haul their lobster pots below us. One or two signal to your window to be king of inlets and fuchsia bushes after years of bitterness and excessive dialectic of dreams and writing is one sweet reward for having fought alone, though words are never left alone. Unlike brickwork or well-vaulted art, words are dislodged from their makers. Think of the soldiers who bedded down with Alderlin's ironic poems or the way fascism disfigured Goethe. You, Claude, dear raconteur, your toughest words came down on those who murdered print, absurd kings and magnates who kept fascism afloat. The wisdom of your life exposes both, as well as war, which comes a deadly third. Whose submarine lingers in our harbour then? Its metal eye bobbing in the water, October sunshine bouncing from its nose. The racing Ardmore tide tries to expose its menace. The brown heather lies asleep while war and neutrality play hide and seek among the ruins of the harbour castle. A breeze breaking its brass and ivy bell that breathes the most enlightened of us all. Our politics as brainless as bird call and equally as colourful. What good is colour if the navigators are blind? You, Claude, only you have kept the millennial cause while others settled for a luxury acre. Now you weep for others barely employed in the second great depression of our time. Worry is training your neighbour and his kind for war. You know how greatly they enjoyed our last emergency, with high prices and good money from the most barren land. Go tell them about the latest nuclear device, or how the world is hanging from a precipice that only journalists like you can cure. Teach us what good politics may be for, social jobs and social good, clean rivers, guns into plowshares, etc., an end to fear. No doubt, dear author, you teach them, if you could, simple politics for a common good. Your ageing throat deserves some rest, and yet you warn others to check for trouble in their necks. So that was my, my memory of, of Todd, one of the most political poems I've written, actually. Um, Todd had that effect on you. Uh, I, when I was very young, my parents died, um, and I wrote a few poems about them. Um, I'll just read uh, one of these about being at my father's grave. Um, that was written a long time ago now. Paul Snow. It is an image of irreversible loss, this hole in my father's grave that needs continuous filling. Monthly now, my uncle comes to shovel a heap of earth from the spare mound. Tear filled compensates the collapse of his brother's frame. I arrive on my motorbike to help, but he will not share the weight of grief. It is six months since my father's death, and he has had to endure a deep snow. All night it came down, silently like time, visiting, smoothing everything into sameness. I visited the winter cold grave expecting a set of his footprints, a snow miracle. And this poem, they're going, they're dying. There's a special sorrow that we reserve for parents, so deep that the world of love, a world of small happenings, of babies born and young wives undressing for a second time cannot gain access. Philosophy itself can hardly probe so deep only the rain clouds bursting on mountains overhead. My white writing window, leaves blown against glass by the spirit of a storm, or a dog howling against the first frost of the year can reach the subjective hollow in the head. Thus, the old impress our lives with their deaths, having borne us in pain to start the argument and opened their loved-filled hearts just too late 
to leave us abruptly wondering where they went.